So welcome and uh, please take your seat in our virtual space cafe today. As you can see, we moved to StreamYard. It is new for us, so please be patient with us if um, things does not go as well as expected. So um, we are recording this webinar session and we will make it available on spacewatch.global in a few days. Um, we are also streaming today this Space Cafe on YouTube and other platforms, including our own website. So in case you have any question, please use only the chat section in StreamYard or on YouTube. So I encourage you to send your questions over. So please be engaged. Last point before we start, please keep your messages in the chat in a professional and respectful tone. Otherwise, we will have to take actions. And now, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, everyone. Good morning. I am a welcome. Today is Wednesday, the 6th of March, 2024. And uh, today we're here for a special cafe summit, a roundtable of exceptional women uh, in the space sector. We all met through the Carmon project, and I will have the chance to introduce them in a few minutes. Uh, as always, as Thorsten said, uh, talking in front of a screen is much more pleasurable if there are people interacting with us. So please feel free to send us questions and feedbacks because that's help us in our, uh, in our work. Uh, today, we are also, as uh, Thorsten mentioned, we are starting something new. We changed the platform, so we are all a bit insecure and be fragile, so be kind to us because we are experimenting a bit. And we are also inaugurating a giveaway competition with StreamYard. And um, if everything works, as uh, the theory book said, if you just type uh, hashtag women in space in your comments, in the chat, or in StreamYard, or on YouTube, uh, you are in the draw to win, uh, to have the chance to win a Spacewatch Global teacher. So try your chances, type hashtag women in space. And of course, you can do it only once. Don't keep typing women in space. That's not fair. And, uh, you know, who knows? You might just walk away with a t shirt. So good luck. In case you don't know us, uh, Spacewatch Global is a Europe-based online platform about focused on, on space. We speak about space in all its uh, uh, shades and degrees, and in particular, we are focused on space and space activities in a geopolitical context. Before we start, allow me to explain you a couple of our products. Uh, first of all, I want to thank our business club members, which allow, uh, which support allow us to maintain our independence in journalism. We really appreciate uh, your work, your, your support. And if you want to join the business club, just uh, see the banner below where there is the link to connect and know more about this opportunity. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletters. We have a daily newsletter. We have a weekly newsletter. Now we even have a space communication news newsletter curated by uh, my very own self. It's called Nobody Cares About Your Satellite. So if you're intrigued about what we speak, just follow the link in the chat. Louise uh, will post all the links to sign up and, and join the, the dialogue. Uh, we also passed our 101th edition of our Space Cafe podcast with Marcus Muschle. Uh, so don't miss the last one with uh, Robert Tutamai, who is the project manager at the European Southern Observatory uh, of the Extremely Large Telescope in Chile. We also have new episodes of our Space Cafe radios. We publish twice a week. So the best buy. The best way to, to be kept uh, updated with what we do is to sign up for our uh, Spotify uh, channels. Again, you will see the, the links in, uh, in the chat. And of course, if you have missed any of our web talks, we have a huge archive on our, uh, web, sec on our web page. So just go on our website and you can find everything. And again, we will put the links in the chat so you can just see what we have done in the past 10 years since this is the first day that you meet us. And now we're done with the ads and we can finally start. Uh, welcome everyone to the Women in Leading, Women, Women Leading uh, the Space Frontier Summit. Today we are diving into the empowerment of women in the space sector and the unique challenges that we face uh, um, being uh, somehow a minority in, in this field. This seems appropriate every year for the 8th of March, we try to organize something that can highlight our community, 
and what does it mean to belong to this community and what we can do together to improve it. Joining me, there are four exceptional women who have carved the niches in our industry. We all met through the Carmon project, so a big shout out to the project who allowed us to come together. Allow me to introduce you, introduce you Anna Ashford, the Managing Director of the Carmon Project Foundation. Welcome, Anna. Anastasia Stepanova, engineer, space journalist, PhD candidate at the Colorado School of Mines and the first female test subject in the experiment, dry immersion. Welcome, Anastasia. Thank you for being here with us. It's a pleasure. Manny it's a pleasure. <laughs> you. Manny Tiro, the former head of space and satellite at Amazon Web Services, Asia Pacific. Welcome, Manny. Thank you for being here with us. And uh, Dr. Norilmi Amelia, Ismail, the CEO of Space Scene, directly from Malaysia. Hello, Norilmi, welcome. Hello, thank you for having me. So why I invited these outstanding women? Uh, because they all have a common trait. the influential roles in the space industry and they journey through leadership position. So today, what I want to discuss with them is uh, to shed a light on what it takes to ascend to this type of roles. We all know it's not easy. We all know it's challenging. But why is challenging uh, what it takes to ascend to these roles and how, uh, how we can cultivate a more inclusive leadership landscape? So this is not just about women in space. It's about women leading in space, having leadership roles. Um, Hannah? Let's break the ice. I know you're a perfect icebreaker, so we'll focus with you. Let's kick off. Could you share with us your journey to becoming the managing director of the Carmon Project Foundation? What inspired this path? Over to you. Sure thing. Thank you, Emma. And thank you so much again to Space Watch for inviting us all to be here. I think I'm always humbled and a little bit intimidated when I'm in the presence of Carmen Fellows. So, so to be here today to also share my journey uh, with you all is, is really a privilege and, and I very much appreciate it. So thank you again. Uh, so yeah, look, in terms of, of my journey, I would say that the journey to becoming, well, first of all, the journey into space was very much founded in um, the Carmen Project itself. So I, I really found my path to space through the Carmen Project. And and the way that I ended up here, to be honest, was sort of through a series of rather fortunate uh, opportunities and, and accidents. Um, my career started firstly in law. So I have a background uh, in, in law, which I started here in Australia. And then uh, my journey took me overseas to, to Berlin, uh, where I sort of transitioned into the, the startup sector and was really working across a number of impactful technologies there around uh, digital health and climate tech and, and all different types of, of innovations. And the common thread, I think, that has always, you know, motivated me and, and you know, kept me going in, in my career and particularly in those formative years of my career was very much around people and impact. So the reason I studied law and, and I also studied journalism. So the reason I really went into those fields around communication and people was, was with this foundational understanding of wanting to, to understand, you know, how systems worked and, and how uh, systemic injustices were formed. Um, I'm very passionate about First Nations rights here in Australia. And, and that thread of, of people is something that has always very much driven, driven this journey. And then at the time when I was in Berlin, I was working across impactful technologies, very much understanding how they had different types of social influences and impacts. And in that time, I came across space. And to be honest, I'm not a person who sort of had uh, ever considered a career in space because uh, all of the sort of subjects around STEM are not particularly uh, my, my strengths, I would say. So I had never considered or, or even really known that I could have a career in space. And uh, at the time of the, when the Carmen Project was being formed, so um, Helen Huby, who was the, the chair and uh, one of the co-founders of the Carmen Project, was sort of in a, in a stage of her career where she was uh, one of the European leaders of the Artemis contributions um, with the European Service Module and, and was in this position of really seeing the global dynamic in space and understanding, okay, 
feeling deeply frustrated and, and a little bit depressed about where things were at in terms of genuine trust and relationship building. And Helen and I actually had a had a chat this morning about how many of our great ideas come when we're in these moments of sort of great depression and frustration or, you know, we're tired and we're delirious and then things just happen. And and I think the Carmen project, you know, the genesis of it was really from from that. And and she had come across me in my work in Berlin and really knew that people were at the center of, of everything that I was doing. Uh, so then we sort of came together with with another group and thought, okay, what can we do and how can we start a foundation that very much places trust and relationships and humans at the center? So my journey into space has very much been with this lens of of people and relationships and and building very genuine dialogue between people and trying to find avenues for courageous dialogue as well. So really understanding how to create environments where people can have conversations that perhaps would be uncomfortable in other circumstances and and form what pathways to to facilitate that in a very meaningful way so uh yeah it was you know it when I look back I, I often have to question why I'm in space uh but space is so meaningful and so impactful to many of the most time critical challenges that we are facing here on earth and I think as well the fact that I've come from a non-space background and ended up in space uh really means that I'm I'm very conscious and I, I continuously challenge myself to to ensure that I'm very aware of all of the societal impacts that space can have uh, and ensuring that that people stay at the center of that narrative because ultimately uh, change starts with people so we need to ensure that those relationships are, are very much at the center so yeah quite an accidental journey but one that I'm very grateful to to have have stumbled the best, upon. The best journey are all accidental this is my <laughs> <laughs> this is my experience. Um, so thank you very much, Hannah. This is I, I knew about your journey by hearing how you shape your career. This is really interesting and fascinating. Also show how diverse can be the space, the space sector, the space environment. Because now we go to the opposite side to a person that actually has space as her original background, and it's not in me. Like you led, you lead the company in Malaysia. This is setting you up apart you are like the white fly or, or the black sheep depending on how you like to be considered uh, could you tell us more about your journey is extremely fascinating for you from the first time we met i thought that you were absolutely outstanding for whatever you for everything you're doing uh, can you explain us how uh, what propelled your journey towards this leadership role which is full of responsibilities Torsten, I think we need to unmute Norilmi. Uh, no, so, oh, now she is. There you go. Uh, thank you Classic. so much for having me uh, of Space Watch. And I think my uh, I'm started as a graduate from aerospace engineering in University of Science Malaysia in Malaysia. But somehow, actually, I changed my field to automobile when I graduated working in an automobile company for two years. But I still think that I still in love with space. So I backed uh, furthering my study in Glasgow University in uh, space. But then when I back from Glasgow, this is where it all started. Uh, I've started teaching uh, in university, but I'm having problems or challenge, we can call that, uh, in teaching the student because uh, we know that industry in Malaysia, the space industry is not that really uh, developed in during that time and we have a very bad experience in launching a satellite and other things so uh, for you as a uh, lecturer or researcher you try to show to your student that uh, when you took this course you have jobs at the end but i can't really promise that that's that's the problem but at the same time i'm thinking that i have to do some things so we don't really have a satellite or other things to show to the student when i'm teaching so i'm i'm sourcing from outside uh, even though using my my own money and even i brought my student uh, to to met and uh, uh, their friends maybe from other countries so they can exchange their experience and I was selected as a, a one of the grantee for the uh, Imaging Space Leader Grant during 2014 in Toronto. This is where actually I met lots of people in the space industry. And this is when I actually started thinking that I have to do something for Malaysia. So uh, 
uh, I just realized that I'm not the first one coming from Malaysia for that grant. Uh, we have another two. So I think that why not that you are actually being selected as an emerging space leader. So you have to do something when you back, when you, you see everything in the IAC. So I'm thinking that, okay, let's do something. So then I joined a few conference and met a few friends that Malaysians that really, really love a space and really want to do something in space. So I'm gathered a few people together. Then we actually have our own, uh, the NGO that pushed the industry in Malaysia. But uh, I think we're not really successful. NGO don't really have a very uh, prominence uh, to speak up to, to push this industry. And then uh, my students still asking me uh, where actually they can have a job for this space industry. So I'm thinking that, okay, uh, if the industry is not there, why not start from you? You can do anything. If you can do something, actually. So I'm thinking, okay, let's do a company. So maybe what, what that then let's see what will happen from there. But not really that it's like uh, I'm just throw myself to this entrepreneurship, but I'm still preparing for that. So I have a few research, then we spin off the, the products, then we can have a companies. At the same time, I'm still love teaching, so I'm doing two jobs. But uh, still for me, uh, when I'm leading uh, my company, this is a business, so I really, really need to be serious to do the business. At the same time, I think I also hold the responsibility because I've already done so much for 12 years uh, in the space industry in Malaysia. So I think I still have the responsibility to help these nations uh, to be to propel in this space industry. So I'm working with the agency, I'm working with the Malaysia Space Agency and also other agency. And now I can see that it's not really only me, but also others people that are working together with me. We can see that we we can we can we have now something like Malaysia have this uh, roadmap toward the space industry. At the same time, now the ministry actually look on the industry, this industry specifically, space industry as one of the pillar for the Ministry of the Science and Technology. This is something that I think quite achievement for us in the space uh, people in the Malaysia, in Malaysia. So uh, I can say that uh, for me, the inspiration actually coming from my student. Uh, I live uh, together with them. And also, they, when, of course, when you with the young people, you feel young also. And you, you have something new that you can explore together. And also, I love coaching people so that uh, we can actually uh, gain something together from that coaching sessions or mentoring. So instead of only having one no real me, I can reproduce more no real me. This is good things that I can do for the country. So in the conclusion, I can see that uh, the inspiration coming, of course, from the young generations. And this is like giving a fuel for me to work harder and also to do something for the space industry in Malaysia. Thank you, Norilmi. I can testify that uh, when Hannah organized uh, a visit at the University of Malay and the Maldives, Norilmi was surrounded by students, literally, because everyone wanted to talk to her. So this is very, very interesting. I also really like the concept of you have to do something if you see a gap. Maybe we'll pick it up later. Uh, Anastasia, you experience uh, uh, probably, in my opinion, one of the harshest side of the space sector, like the physical training, the lab hours, uh, the hardcore training that a cosmonaut uh, or an astronaut has to experience. And you plus have the incredible vision of two countries that unfortunately now they are also having some tensions because you come from Russia, so you experience the Russian space sector, but you now uh, live and work in the US, which means that you're experiencing both. I'm really curious to understand from your perspective, you still perceive that men and women in the space industry are treated, are uh, um, considered differently, are treated in a different way. What's your experience? Because obviously this is something you live on your skin every day. Yeah. Yeah, um, thank you. It's really a great question. Um, and yeah, I will be honest. So um, when I moved to US, I thought, oh, here uh, will be way less 
I guess, prejudice towards women in space. But unfortunately, it still exists here. <laughs> I guess it's just th this field is um, so conservative. Uh, it's changing, but it needs more um, rapid changes. Um, there is still men's plating um, and um, still a lot of doubts when you as an expert uh, give your opinion about uh, a subject or like any project and etc. Um, you know, there would be more doubts. Uh, and when the man does this, um, you know, straight away, other men listen to him more and uh, more, um, yeah, they're less, let's say, they're less passive aggressive rather than when a, a female tells them, oh, um, here was, um, you know, this thing went wrong because of that, or maybe you should change this and etc. cetera. Um, what I face is that there are a few men that um, in the leadership positions that take it hard way when a, a girl or, um, you know, an expert tells them that something went wrong. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, but we are still working on that. Um, and I think the best way to change it um, is to show that you're a great professional, uh, and um, to just uh, break all the stereotypes about uh, women in space. Um, and another thing that also I noticed that during the experiments, so there is like this um, um, stereotype again in all the isolation experiments that um, if we bring uh, women to the long space flights, uh, if you go to the moon or Mars, that they would distract men. Yes, <laughs> and uh, that the flirt starts and then relationship and it will just mess up the whole, um, you know, mission. Um, and so I think this we can also change by just uh, participating in many um, experiments like isolation, analog experiments and missions and just uh, again show that um, we are professionals and we don't um, see men as a sexual uh, subject. I get, well, actually often it's the opposite. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> they blame it on us. This fact that there is still uh, um, these stereotypes uh, is uh, rather, uh, I don't know why I'm surprised. I shouldn't probably be surprised, but the fact that we're still th thought as a item of distraction is rather fascinating in an almost uh, anthropological way, <laughs> sort of way. Um, yeah, as, like, like Anna experienced one side probably of the space sector. You experience a completely different side, which is the engineering side. And uh, we know he's a, probably more of a hardcore um, club to, to, to break. Um, Mani, uh, you have done something uh, extremely fascinating, something that uh, Anastasia and I did too. You decided to change career. Uh, this is a brave step. I know it because I've done myself, but uh, I would like you to, to, to tell us somehow, to guide us through uh, your decision-making process and its implications for, for women seeking to somehow redefine the professional trajectories, especially after having climbed the career ladder so high because you were starting, you decided to, 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 to leave in a moment of, of peak in a sort of way. So you already... Uh, building your career at the highest level. I, I would love to hear your uh, your impressions, your feelings. And of course, the the question uh, is, is needed. How is it going? <laughs> because you're in the <laughs> middle of it. <laughs> I'm right in the middle of it. Um, thank you for the question and thank you for the invitation. It's so good to be back here with you guys, with my friends and anyone who's listening. Um, we had such a great time together. For me, it feels almost like, I know we're just a screen away, but I could almost put my arms around each of these wonderful ladies. I'll begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I'm now um, standing on, the Gadigal people of the Euro Nation. I'm back in Sydney, I'm back in Australia, this is home. Um, and I'm really excited, Emma, to answer your question. I have, um, you know, the, the notion of a career break or resetting is not something that I've ever looked at or considered. Um, and to be honest, it's only when you do it that you start running into other people who are going through this process of looking for clarity, really. Um, because like you said, I feel like I got to a place where it was an incredible 
um, role that I had. I was managing a team looking after the space sector for Amazon Web Services across Asia Pacific. So I had interactions with um, the Indian space sector, with the Japanese space sector, the Korean space. You know, everyone was doing something amazing. There was a mission going up every other uh, month or whatever it was. It was super exciting. And um, the, the crunch of it, I, I guess, for me personally, you know, I've been... I'd been with Amazon for nearly six years, I think. Um, and it was, um, Amazon's a, it's a monster when it comes to growth targets, you know, so it's double digit growth year after year. Um, and particularly after COVID and particularly with, you know, the current um, economic contractions, I don't know if it's contracting or expanding, you know, every day I talk to an economist, <laughs> it's a different story. But in that time of pressure, it became um, really, really hard. It became really hard because, um, you know, I, I led a sales team. I led a team that was essentially bringing money for the company, um, which is good on a good day. But when you're when your customers are also going through um, the same economic contractions that we're all facing, um, then it gets a little bit difficult, you know. And and we really have to start talking about the value of cloud in space and all of that other good solution selling or whatever value based selling um, that you're used to. So it was a great role. It was an exciting role. But I, I've chosen to step away for a while and really only it's just to take a deep breath for myself and to ascertain, um, I guess I'm looking for clarity. What am I really good of, good at after 20 years of being in the tech sector? Um, you know, what am I known for? What, what do people think of when they think of Manny? Do I know what that is? What can I offer that is a value to people or companies right now? And that's a, it's for me, it's, it's just a fascinating um, introspection and I have the luxury of doing that. I'm sort of privileged because I can afford to take a couple of months off to think about these things. But I think it's helpful for us. And, you know, you don't have to stop your, you don't have to stop working to do this. Obviously, if you can carve out time on a daily basis, that would be amazing. Or even a weekly, monthly basis. And that's what uh, supposedly our holidays are for. But, you know, the holidays are crushed with so many other things. So if we can just take a moment to, breathe and you know it's it's not the usual self-care but it's really from a long-term perspective who am i what do i want to be and we ask ourselves that when we come out of university and you know we're climbing that ladder but 10 15 20 years later you're somewhere and then you've got to ask yourself am i happy am i making an impact do i love the people that i work with do the customers that i serve benefit from my skills so that's kind of that those are some of my original thought processes i've just started it's been a month since i've stopped with amazon and i'm going through that process of figuring out for myself um what do i want to do where can i add the most value where can i make impact so it's an ongoing journey i will let you <laughs> keep asking me questions as we go through this process um and, and for the broader uh, community to figure out how i can you know bring some of my learnings in into into something that's maybe valuable for others if they're considering this. Thank you, Mani. This is such an interesting uh, contribution, like the question of impact, the question of stress and the matter of aligning your skills and talent with your destiny somehow and like going in the right direction, not just about your technical skills, but also your values and your ethics. And I cannot imagine anything more stressful than working in the sales team, leading the sales team at Amazon. Uh, it makes me shiver only thinking about the stress you could have had. I'm going to throw it out in the open uh, ring of uh, chaos and destiny. I want to see a collaboration, Hannah Ash, for Manithiru, because I think yeah, there are so many things that could go together, you know. Uh, Anna, passion about people and, uh, and putting um, people at the center, relationship and cooperation and your energy and your willingness to actually move out from a box and just discover who you really are and what you really like and what is important for you, for Manny, instead of what is important for a company. I can see fireworks coming out of this. <laughs> now, thank you very much for to all of, of the four of you. I, was, I knew I was going to do the right thing inviting you. This is uh, fantastic because I, I know you. I know your values. I know your strength. I know your power and energy. And I know your passion, which are all things that I see 
as elements that we can bring to the table. But um, it open, I'm going to open now the dialogue to everyone. So it's like an open question for you four, but also for our member of the audience, if they want to comment on this. I'm really curious to understand what's the general opinion um, about exactly this, about which type of unique contribution can we, uh, as women, bring to the space sector? Uh, Today we're speaking about the space sector, we could speak about any tech or any professional real. What does female leadership signify to you and how uh, can it enrich any type of uh, environment? Because in the end, a professional environment is a human environment. And again, going back to what Hannah said, people are always at the center. So how we act, how we think, uh, it makes the working environment. So what can we bring to the table? I leave it open. I want to hear your opinion. Who wants to take it? Who wants to start? Uh, can I start first? Whoa, go for it, Norimi. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, this is from the experience that uh, women normally low risk taker, and uh, because of that, we are analyze things more deeper. And this actually sometimes I, I get the feedback from uh, some female uh, male colleagues saying that you take too long to get uh, to to take the, your decisions. Yeah, but I have to look on the risk that I have to, to be taken. But thank God, because I'm taking that time and I get, I, I make the right decision for that. So for me, uh, we actually can look more into the detail, the different perspective, and also because of what we are logistic taker, then we do lots of things to analyze. The, I think this is somehow uh, can give a benefit uh, for the space mission, especially when you uh, really need to look very, very detailed in all the things because you, you don't want the, your spacecraft or other, uh, your, your spaceship up there to be not function. So this is one of them, I think. Thank can you, Noreen. Miss, anybody else wants to? Yes, I think Oh, sorry, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I, look, I really echo what, what Naromi said, and I'd also just add that I think that when, we, when we think about these questions, I, I think that we need to also see that, of course, it, it's sort of twofold. There's both an opportunity and a necessity to involve females in the space industry, and, and I, that can be extrapolated to, you know, all, all different stakeholders in space. And I think that if we're truly speaking about shaping the future of space which is something which you know i'm sure we all agree and, and many of the people in the audience agree is the next frontier in so many ways in terms of advances in technology science and um, enabling services to to earth if we are truly shaping a global you know industry that is so impactful then there is a necessity to include and represent the voices of many different stakeholders in in that process and i mean you know we're not just talking about technology development you're also talking about policy about education as narelmi has touched on you're talking about every aspect of space and i think what is so beautiful and unique about space is that you know it has such an inherent requirement of cooperation uh, at an international level you know there are few individuals or companies or, or even agencies that have the resources to do any of the missions that we're speaking about on their own. So it requires collaboration. And if you're speaking about true collaboration, if you're speaking about true multilateral stakeholder engagement, that needs to be representative of the people. And in an industry that has, you know, mainly men at the top and is not representative of females or female identifying people or, you know, all, all of the different, uh, you know, e even when we're talking about space, we were traditionally, this is a sector that was shaped by um, few, a very few number of nations. And now we're also entering this, this new era where participation and access to space is being enabled at a wider scale. So I think that it really comes down to, again, knowledge and representation and ensuring that we have this opportunity to access, you know, all of the brilliant minds that are out there across the world and, and in all different demographics uh, of space and across the many disciplines that are represented within space. And quite frankly, if we're not doing that, 
then we're missing out on something and we can't truly say that we are shaping the next frontier because, you know, that can't be done in, in any type of silo. Um, and I would also then say, I think the second part of that is, is you know, the, the, the unique leadership skills that women can bring. And I think when we tend to think about leadership, we have all sort of been brought up in environments where the skills that we tend to equate with leadership are probably more traditionally masculine traits, perhaps. And I think that things are shifting in terms of our understanding of, of what leadership is. And, and as Naromi said, there are many different uh, traits that are perhaps more embodied by females that uh, I think we're now seeing can bring immense value uh, to all different projects and missions and teams. Uh, I think, you know, there, there are so many things in terms of kind leadership and, and empathetic leadership and leadership that is much more tailored to understanding the people in your environment and around you. Uh, and I think that it's a really exciting moment if we, if we stop sort of uh, working in this binary of, you know, males against females, I think that we have a really exciting moment to say, you know what, let's just look at all the brilliant brains that are out there and how to harness them. Uh, and let's try to support initiatives that that do that. There are so many initiatives in space that are facilitating diversity. Uh, and I think it's incumbent upon anybody in leadership uh, to really proactively think about how you're doing that. Uh, so, yeah, I would also extrapolate that to, to many aspects of diversity and, and inclusion in space. Thank you, Anna. A comment before uh, I pass to the, the next speaker. Uh, I agree with what you said. One of my questions, and I open us, so this is a sub-question we can discuss about this later, is my wondering if we do have a role model for matriarchal of female leadership, because as you say, female leadership is probably different from masculine leadership or men leadership. I'm not sure we have seen it yet blossoming in a certain way. We are all here trying to understand what's the best way to tailor this suit on our skin. Because as you say, growing up, the models of leadership are all men models. So I'm just wondering if we don't have this model yet and we have just seen growing and coming out and exploring and understanding what does really mean, what are the real values of true feminine or women leadership. This is just an open question. Well, over to uh, Mani and Anastasia. What do you think about which type of skills and abilities and unique traits we can bring to, to the table? Anna, do you want to go first? Or do you want me to oh, kick it? Okay, I, I will be fast. <laughs> um, yeah, I, when I think about space missions, um, I see that really we could bring the compassion and uh, uh, caring about each other or crew members, right? We start from the small society and then it can go bigger to evolve bigger to the world in general, to the world in general. So um, what I noticed that um, we have this in our DNA, that we have this uh, motherly feeling, right? And um, whenever we are even working like in uh, space missions as professionals, still you cannot get rid of that. And um, I remember in, in my missions, um, the crew was getting together um, a female that was taking care um, of the crew members, not only as a professional, but also kind of with this motherly feelings. And it really bonded everyone together and uh, created this, you know, uh, this f f uh, friendly uh, environment. Um, and uh, environment without any uh, ego competition. And I think that's what we are missing in the modern days um, in space field. Uh, also, we are still have this, um, you know, uh, egos and uh, especially when we talk about the private space sector, it's a uh, competition all the time. Um, and it's hard to, uh, I think, let it go and be, honest and be creative when you all the time worry that you know someone will set you up or something like that um and i think we can change that uh, but also another thing that um i've noticed and i hope it will ch will change that uh females they yes uh, they started to use the masculine way of being a leader and uh that became into a little mess. That's how, um, you know, all the stereotype were born. Uh, I mean, men look at the females who try to um, be a leader uh, as a man. And um, so many times I saw like a bad example of that. 
um, or misogyny. Um, and uh, so I really hope <laughs> that, um, you know, we start to notice it more and more and, um, you know, actually be true to ourselves, to our nature uh, and have the different um, pattern of behavior in the leadership. Thank you, Anastasia. Like Manny. Yeah, I like it. I like where she was going with this. Um, okay. I do think we've got to mix up with what um, what feminine energy or what feminine leadership looks like. And you you talked about um, examples or role models. And honestly, mine are so mixed. You know, they're, they're not just from the space industry. Um, I think of um, I think of she was an Australian of the Year, Grace Team. She's amazing. Uh, Hannah, you probably know Grace's name. I think of Malala. I think of people like Greta Thunberg. And I think there's, you know, there's elements of female or feminine, fierce feminine leadership coming out there. I think of people like Jacinda Ardern, the previous um, uh, Prime Minister of New Zealand. Um, you, you know, they're, they're global figures who I think we can look to. And even within the space industry, to be honest, um, and I've got to reacquaint myself with a lot of different women in the Australian um, space industry, but they are. There are women here who are um, doing or behaving in, in leadership capacities, which I think is the beginning of something, something, beginning of something. You know, I don't think we've quite figured it out because um, we have looked at men to for what good leadership looks like. But 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 I think we can be, to what Hannah was saying earlier, I think we can be a lot more softer. And that by soft, I don't mean weak. I mean softer in the way we engage but there's still assertion behind it uh you know we can be effective communicators because we're so much more i think we're always much more i don't know it's not a comparison with the men but i think we're always a little bit more attuned to ourselves so we have um i think we have oodles of empathy we can lead with compassion you know we should we should at some point there should be awards for compassionate uh management rather than managing the next unicorn that scaled um so quickly to into into millions of returns but you know at what cost did that come so we don't really we don't i, I guess we don't really think about those kind of norms or, or or things like that at the moment but i think um I mean, there's nothing to stop us from developing <laughs> what a good leadership model looks like at, from a woman's perspective, right? I don't know. I don't know if it's if there's any any research been done like that. But when I think about when I think about where we are today, you know, we've got we've still got the climate crisis, and we've been talking about that for decades now. We still have I don't know how many conflicts there are going around the world, but at, at the tables of all of these institutions. Um, are all men. The men are taking decisions. And so far, I haven't really seen any any changes. We still have wars and we still have, we still seem to be on uh, uh, on a decline as far as uh, the environment is concerned. So I think female leadership is more critical than ever. Uh, we need, we, we need more women who are, who are strong, who are capable, who have the courage um, and conviction to put themselves forward and really try and um, try something that maybe hasn't been done before. I mean, there's nothing to stop us from whether we're in the space sector or outside of. And the space sector has so many different angles, right? We all know how well they intersect with the rest of the economy, with um, planetary management, with um, health, with a, a, any 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 angle from space. We can spin into uh, any part of the economy. So, I think it's an important question, Emma. What does good um, good leadership look like but then if you want to put down a subtext what does what's a what's a good female role model what does good feminine leadership look like um and something that we should keep asking ourselves until we feel like we've got the answer today's a good start <laughs> thank you money you hit the nail in the head absolutely there are still men too many men taking the most important decision and here we are still going around in a new cycle of history doing the same mistakes we still have war we still have fierce competition we still have fights and uh, this is exactly the reason why I'm having this panel today to understand if we as women, can we change this dialogue? Can we change the language? How uh, the world economy in the more general sense can be interpreted? I completely agree. You mentioned Malala, you mentioned the first minister, the former first president of New Zealand. Uh, I could add Greta. I don't think it's a coincidence that one of the most important figure in climate change is a young woman. So yes, women can be fierce in the fight when they fight for in, against injustice. 
but we still kept outside this decision room. And so we cannot uh, bring our values, uh, our compassion, our empathy, uh, our cooperation, as Anna was mentioning, into the decision room. And I think that's fundamental, absolutely. And yeah, the, nobody will ever at the moment, this is a sign of the mentality of the time. There is no a, um, price of the year for the most compassionate leader. No, there is the price of the year for the highest seller, the highest bidder, the one that had more aggressively tackled the, the market, the one that brought more money in. There is never the, our value system, empathy, cooperation, peace, relationship um, are not considered yet. I consider as weak, mm. not as soft. And this is a fundamental issue, which is why it's at the core of what I'm trying to bring out today as, as a debate. Uh, thank you so much, all the four of you, for this really important contribution. I can see there are a lot of questions. So I think we can open the stage and bring in some of the audience and see what they have to ask us. What do you think? So we just interactively with them. Uh, first question from Christoph. Hello, everyone. Uh, what men can do everywhere to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem, or at least not stand in the way? So how can men be part of this change, support us or, you know, merge with us? Because as Mani mentioned, this is not, in general, we want to go towards universal human value. We don't want to create, keep maintaining the split between men and women. We want to try to find a human compromise that brings in female and male values at the same level. So this is correct. What can men do? Personally, my opinion is that our limitation is also their limitation because as much as we are not allowed to participate in certain part of life, they are not allowed to enter to access our empathic area. They're not allowed to cry. They're not allowed to show weaknesses. They're not allowed to be upset, which is extreme, is a, a limitation of, of the human soul in a sort of way. So um, what men can do, uh, ladies, what do you think? <laughs> back, back women, Christoph, back women, um, support anyone in your circle who needs, uh, whether it's technical support or things that you're good at that you can, um, you know, in, in the capacity of a mentor or a sponsor, if you have authority in an organization, get behind them, promote them, help them climb the ladder. Um, and I swear to God, most women will pay it back in so many different ways that you'd be surprised you'd be like oh my god i should have done 10 of them <laughs> that should be your investment into women um over a startup and then and not even taking anything away from <laughs> naromi but support women and um it, it, it's just gonna work it's just gonna create some magic and uh, to this i add also christophe my personal answer is not stop using women as little soldiers that they can just push yours goals, but listen to what they want to develop and give them the power, empower them to develop this. And unfortunately, I realize the absurdity in this sentence. We're still in a stage when we have to ask men to give us the power to, they have to allow us. I hope in one generation, this will not be needed. I hope that we will not yet need to ask men to give us the power. But unfortunately, we are still in this kind of transition in which we need to ask men, can you give me the room to develop? And one of the things that I found more distressing at the moment is still too many men use women as secretaries, as assistants, without listening what they can bring to the table. So start to think about women as equal partners, not as your supporting little soldiers to move your advance. This is my answer. Over to you. Okay, I can um I can also add to that then. I mean, I, I think as well it's just really important to to turn up even even to things like this. I, I think my experience of International Women's Day in the past years has been mainly female audiences. Whenever I've been on any type of, of panel, it's and I think that that's really interesting because I'm I mean we're essentially then speaking into an echo chamber, we're preaching to the choir, we're speaking about common issues and experiences that that we all it, you know, we understand so deeply and so inherently because we live it every day. And I think that it's really important to ensure that we create spaces. Maybe maybe it's also incumbent upon, upon organisations and women to also, you know, drag men into some more of these conversations and, and make, it, make sure that it is comfortable and that it's not an abrasive 
tough conversation to have, but it's really about enabling and support. And I think that, so firstly, you know, just turning up and being willing to have these conversations is such an important part. And particularly on that personal level, as, as many were saying, you know, um, you know, be an advocate for the women who are around you, who are in your direct orbit, um, you know, be cognizant of what their dreams are, actively ask them, you know, where they want to go, what their career goals are, and then, you know, think how you can support that. And then I think as well, if you are a person who is in a position of leadership at a workplace, you also need to be thinking about what policies are in place at your workplace and do they serve women? Because ultimately, I think change will start. There's going to be personal barriers that women are experiencing. I think imposter syndrome is a, a very big one that that um, you know everyone everyone's nodding a lot. Yes, um, we. I think you know every conversation I have with women in space and leadership, everyone is really suffering with imposter syndrome. So there's those personal barriers. So do what you can to to support women around you and overcoming those personal barriers and um, and you know feeling validated and and like an equal as as we've discussed. And then I think there's that next level which is the workplace really understand okay what policies are in place and make sure that there's not tokenistic policies but you know um it's not enough to sort of have quotas that say okay we have x number of females in leadership but you know to get the females into leadership you need to start thinking about how to support them at all levels of their career journey you know into mid middle leadership up into senior leadership you know how do you ensure that you have supportive parental leave policies and other policies that are important to women who still have the primary burden as caregivers? You know, think about that. And if you're in a position to change that in your workplace, change that, start those conversations. Um, and then ultimately, I think there's a societal shift that needs to take place in terms of, um, you know, having more conversations like this around what leadership looks like and what leadership, um, you know, the many different faces of leadership and, and more of that role modeling and, and yeah, more conversations that leadership doesn't, it's not one dimensional. Um, there are many different uh, faces to leadership. Uh, and ultimately, I think, you know, it's not just up to women to be pushing these personal workplace and societal changes. It's, it's up to men as well. Um, so, yeah, just turn up. Absolutely. A better working environment for women, in my opinion, is a better working environment for men too, because it's more free. Uh, anybody else want to comment? Anastasia, I know yeah. you yes. So. Yes. Um, so it's, it's a funny paradox about the maternity leave that Hannah just mentioned. So uh, back in Russia, we have from one year up to two years maternity leave. Um, and uh, here in US, everyone, you know, all the women will be like, wow, it's great. But um, what happened with that, that um, all the um, men uh, at leadership positions, whenever they hire uh, a female, and if she's in an age when, you know, she's uh, good to have a, a kids, they uh, would prefer a man because uh, then they would think, okay, we will hire her, then she will go on maternity leave for one year or two, and you know we will just pay her, and we won't have any uh, employer employee. Um, here in US, it's uh, extreme opposite. You would have only like a three months of maternity leave, which is also crazy because men don't realize um, through what through what hell our body goes through, right? And uh, also the hormones and everything. Um, and um, so here uh, you're so stressed to think about career, perceive your career, but also um, if you want to have kids, how you could manage that. Um, and it's just uh, these two worlds, they show two extremes. Um, and uh, I think that's where we also should work on. And uh, the basic one for all the men who think, who asks how we can <laughs> fix that, I think you should just have more trust in us. <laughs> um, and, um, and that's it. Just have uh, the same trust as you would trust your brothers and buddies. <laughs> uh, and you will see how this would, uh, you know, benefit you. Thank you, Anastasia. Not in me. Anything to add? Yeah, because I have this. Because... Uh, uh, this is my experience when I'm hiring. I also actually having this doubt whether I should go to women or men because I need this work to be done very fast. So 
I go through that uh, period, which is uh, I have to think lots about this, but then I get advice from others because uh, me, myself, I don't have any kids. So maybe I don't have any experience on that. So I can say that maybe some men do not have experience of women, how they actually uh, will go through all these things. But at the same time, they can maintain their performance. But I think this is more on how you take all the inputs, uh, all the advice and how actually you listen to the woman and also you look on the performance. Me, myself, when I look on my friends, my colleagues in university, uh, how actually they perform better, maybe more better, much better than uh, the, the men, even though they have a loss of kids. So I think uh, we can't really underestimate the uh, capability of women to do works, which is right, Anastasia, the doubt need to be abolished and put more trust to us. Yes, we, we actually, we can do some things in terms of the policy itself. As a leader, actually, you can shape the policy. This is a good one if you are the female leaders, because you know what will happen to females, so you can shape the policy in your company. Thank you, Norilmi. I want to get another couple. I know that we are at the end of the edge, but you know, I'm gonna. I want to just include a couple of observations from our audience. Has yeah, is asking questions for the panel. How do you have? How do you deal with ageism, especially from younger females, especially Gen Z towards Gen X? How do we deal with younger women? And I suppose the under text here is youth is considered a value attached to women. So a young woman is uh, more valuable than an elder woman because uh, beauty and physical appearance, uh, unfortunately, with women still matter. So I suppose this is the under text in this question. Uh, so how do you do it with ageism, especially from younger females, uh, especially Gen Z toward Gen X? Um, anyone want to answer? So how do we, we feel? Are, we are Gen Am I Gen Gen X? Gen Y? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not, I don't know which Gen I am. Uh, so very okay, good. But, but you know that X. my experience one day, last two weeks, my my staff almost all is actually millennials and also Gen Z. So I normally I I listen to them when they're talking about BTS, uh, yeah. all these <laughs> things, and also uh, and one of the staff told me that oh, when he came to my car and and he, doctor you have spotify <laughs> yeah of course i can have spotify so i think it's more on how actually you adapt with them and actually they are raising in that kind of era which is we go through that era too uh, whether we want to adapt in the environment or not uh, this is up to us but for me, uh, we are really looking for more like, because we want to work with them. This is, you, 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 you can't deny that this is the time that you actually need to work with each other. So what you need to do is to understand them. At the same time, trying to make them understand you too, because uh, you have a dip from different era. Maybe you, you have a different perspective of thinking, but at the same time, I think all the things that the attributes is still the same. Maybe the way actually you bring yourself may be different and because the, the environment that actually they are raised with. So just be understandable with each other. Thank you, Dorimi. Somebody else want to comment on the ageism barrier on this competition that can happen between younger female and uh, um, more experienced female figures? I can't say that I have any experience of it. Um, and I would have to you're Gen X or Gen Z. <laughs> I don't know what Gen I am, but um, honestly, I don't know if this is a this is a gender specific question. I think, you know, in terms of the age brackets, um, what I've heard from one of my startups um, is that uh, a lot of the younger people, so the graduates who are looking for internships at the startups, um, they talk a lot about the hustle culture and they talk about how we, the ones who have been working for the last 10, 20 years, are constantly obsessed with work. We don't have a life outside of work. So there is you know, conversations around the water cooler or whatever, around my life is very different to that. You know, I have a I have a life and then work is something that I do to pay the bills it's it's there, there, there's a different construct there that I, I you know I'm I'm not I'm third party conversation so it's not my conversation 
but I did hear some of that come through. And then the sort of the CEO of the company who has to then figure out, well, you know, I totally get hustle culture. This company is not going to be hustle, hustle culture, but I do need people to come in at nine o'clock and I do need people to do a full eight hours of work in order for me to build the product and, you know, drive the company forward. And and I think on that level, um, there may be some interesting conversations. There may be disparities in how the younger generation view the older generation uh, when it comes to uh, what, what they see inconceivably as, um, you know, just making money. It, it looks like there's that, there's that, um, the, the, the purpose values versus we're here, we're an institution, we're a company, we're going to go big, we're going to make money. Um, I think there's, there's some of that that we can explore. Uh, but I'm not sure that I've ever had this younger woman, older woman that hasn't, I don't have enough experience to talk about that. So no. Yeah, I, I think we need more communication between each other. So when you communicate more, you will understand more. So this is what I'm doing in my company. I talk more with them and I'm trying to understand them. At the same time, they try to understand me. So I think this is sometimes I can work also. So you, you actually can give something to them uh, in terms of the, any attributes or, or maybe you are work, really working hard so this is something that they can uh, be like you are the role models at the same time uh, from them you you see that they are very creative they are resourceful because they can find anything what they want uh, from their fingertips so this is the things that you have to appreciate but communication is very very important thank you Norimi this is the last question I want to take in is a 30 second answer for all of you this is from Ruth from Lagos, Nigeria. Question for this amazing panel. What specific experience have altered or changed you as a leader? Is there one thing that during your career made you change your mind or made you understand, okay, this is something I have to change. This is a mistake I made or this is something that I can see that I didn't predict and now I'm going to be different as a leader because I want to integrate this experience. Who wants to take the stage on this? I can tell you mine, Ruth, while the ladies are thinking. Mine was understanding that uh, um, leadership requires showing uh, and not just speaking. So you need to lead by examples. You need sometimes to do the hardest task yourself to show how it's done. So just telling people how to do it or what to do it doesn't cut it. You need to show them that you are the first one waking up in the morning and doing it and doing it properly. And you show them how to do it. And then they will follow. So leadership is about leading, being the front of the row and taking the hardest challenge and the hardest task. This is uh, one of yeah. the things I learned. For me, uh, I think before this, I take everything my own. I All the work I do myself, and I, I'm thinking that I, I don't really put trust to people, but then somehow one of the staff uh, have a hard to uh, talk, talk to me that uh, you have to trust us. From there, I'm trying to delegate the works, then put the trust. I think from there, I can see that, oh, I'm not the only one can do this work, others can do too. So put more trust to people to, the, to do that uh, and also trying to co coach them. If they have any mistake, uh, you can actually can uh, teach them how to do that and uh, coaching them. So this is will make them grow uh, for their career. Thank you. Somebody has 30 seconds sir. answer. I'll go. Um, go. One of the big things that I, uh, at least as I'm transitioning, I've realized is that relationships matter. Relationships are super important. And it kind of adds to what Naomi is saying in terms of cooperation and trusting in other people. Um, but, you know, you'll have jobs. Jobs will come and go. And even a career, you know, you can build it this way. You can build it that way. You can climb a ladder. You can go sideways. Um, but at the end of the day, it's the people that you're spending your time with. We've got one life and we spend a lot of time at work. So I think if you want to make it as good as it can be for you, um, create genuine relationships, people that you you know love being around with, because then it even stops being work. You're just having you're just having a laugh with a bunch of mates that you're generally heading in the same direction. But um, yeah, relationships matter. Make sure people, you're surrounding yourself with people that you love being surrounded by, even when you're working. Thank you, Mani. Who else? Anna, um, Anastasia. Okay, okay sure. So I, I suppose for me, yes to what Mani said, yes to relationships, all comes down to, to people. Uh, I think a big transformative moment for me in terms of leadership was 
I was given quite a high level of responsibility and leadership when I was at, at, at a young age. So I was in my mid 20s and was given a very large team to lead uh, in Berlin. And I think at the time I was so focused upon embodying these, you know, models of leadership that I had seen, those more masculine traits. Anyone who knows me knows that my natural disposition, I'm smiley, I'm friendly, I, I'm talkative, you know, I use my hands a lot, as you can see, this is me. And I think when I was put into that role of responsibility, I thought, oh, no, I've got to be much more serious and subdued and these things. And it just didn't work for me. And I think that leadership comes down to trust, which comes back to what Manny said about relationships. And and you need to be authentic. And, and that was a very big pivotal moment for me to say, you know what, the reason I was, you know, given this leadership position was because I was myself. So why would I now try to change who I am now that I've attained that position of leadership? So I think really going back and, and ensuring that you are authentic uh, is, is incredibly important. It's still something I struggle with. I still, again, am often one of the youngest people in the room. I'm often one of the only females in the room. So there are many elements of my personality that sometimes I try to subdue in certain environments. Uh, but I still think no matter what, it's really important. And that was a very um, you know critical moment in my leadership journey. Thank you, Anna. Anastasia, you close the stage. Yeah. Um, for me, I never considered myself a leader, honestly. <laughs> um, but I realized that, uh, yes, uh, first of all, it's uh, patience um, with people, compassion, um, and um, listening to them and understanding that they might have totally different perspective on this problem and uh, views. Uh, before, I was way more like, yes, uh, stricter and, you know, uh, like, like from the right stuff uh, of you know early uh, Australian days, uh, quite uh, militarized approach in terms of okay we're in a mission, no feelings, just do the job and etc. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, then I realized that actually um, being compassionate with your crew members um, it will lead you to way uh, better outcomes. So for sure this, although space is really risky and if you're talking about real, um, you know, human space flights, and of course, uh, often feelings are not the best place uh, at the situation of risk. But um, I think, I hope we can find the, you know, proper balance for that. Thank you very much, Anastasia. Before I close the stage, let me remind everyone, Ruth, uh, Yacinda, Veronica, Chiara, try to enter our uh, uh, our draw to win the t-shirt so it's just very simple hashtag women in space in the chat and then somebody could win it and we're not trying to sell you anything <laughs> people are always <laughs> suspicious about those things so try to participate before we uh, we, we extract the lucky one um, before passing the word to Torsten to see who's won uh, uh, the, the, the Space Watch Global Lottery. Allow me to thank these fantastic women that have spent one hour of the time here with me, struggling to just fit, mix, uh, put together Australia and Malaysia and Seattle at the moment together. I can see an Anastasia that is slowly <laughs> going down <laughs> the sleeping curve. So uh, let us uh, uh, let her go to bed. Thank you, Norilmi. Thank you, Anastasia. Thank you, Mani. Thank you, Anna. You are such an inspiration for me. I love to talk to you. I would love this to last six hours because there are so many things to say. I hope we will have the chance to gather together like the Carmen allow us to talk again about those things. It's always so refreshing to hear uh, other women thinking and speak about these problems and knowing that you are not alone in this journey. So this is also very valuable for me to be part of the community. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your time. Uh, it's been an incredible honor for me to have you. Uh, Torsten, do we have a winner in the draw? Who won the T-shirt? Caramba. <laughs> what, an, what a great panel, um, I, I have to say. So let's see that we, that, that we can make that work. Um, we don't know how to do it. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, there's a theory again and, <laughs> and the textbook but we see we have three people in the are uh, in the lottery here and if i click here then da, 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 there could be some excitement exciting music in the background yeah you should wow Ruth. Ruth. wow so please get in touch with us text us and or uh, text us or on one of the channels or um, you, you have that we have your uh, address and uh, your your size for the t-shirt, of course, and then we send it over wherever you are. Wonderful. Hey, that worked. Okay. Thank check. you. Send us a message via LinkedIn so we can uh, send you the t-shirt. I think it's easy. Ab to do that. Absolutely. 
So, um, what else now? Um, I do have to do something here. Uh, we are back with with you guys here, and um, yes, we. I will I will tell you a bit more what what's coming up next for that. Um, I need another background with my next events. Oh, that's, okay, that was not as as expected. Yeah, bad, better, and we put that and that. It worked. So our next event um, next week, um, we or I will be at DJI, um, the Defense Geo Intelligence or Geospatial Intelligence or show in london uh, so if you want to meet or uh, then please reach out to us on the 19th or uh, of march um we will do another 33 minutes with kevin o'connell um the space cafe one of our famous one-to-one -one conversation and we will talk about the upcoming european protectionism in space then next month after the Easter break, um, Emma and I will be in um, Colorado Springs at the Space Symposium. Again, if you want to meet up, please uh, text us and let us know that you are there and we will be more than happy to meet, have a conversation or just record you. So we will see how it goes. On the 24th, um, we will be or I will be in Bremen for the first European Space Plane Summit. How exciting can that be? So, and these are all our events and now and yes it works back so um please find and subscribe um um to, to our newsletters or um wherever you find us on our website or go to social media and as always we would live like to hear your feedback so please check in with x linkedin facebook facebook is more for my generation i know uh, but don't forget to sign up to our daily or bi-weekly, or not, or not bi-weekly, weekly, and our new Nobody Cares About Your Satellite newsletters. And if you want to support more events like that, so go treat yourself um, with something special. Become a Space Watcher today or help us in our supporter club. Thank you very much for your interest today. Thank you, Emma. Thank you to this fantastic panel of powerful women uh, for your inspiring, uh, really, conversation. And... Yes, I mean, I would say even strong women need a man to support them. So that's what was my task today. And I'm happy that I had that. Thank you for the audience for joining us or in our experiment here today on StreamYard. I think that run quite smooth. I hope to see you in our next event. In the meantime, don't forget to visit our website, follow us on social media, and don't forget to become a space watcher. Good. Thank any, you. Any famous words or otherwise we close and we will run the outro. Thank you very much. Bye. And Thank you very soon. much to everyone. Bye. Thanks, Thank guys. You.